Okay. Hello and welcome to the School of Code demo day number three. Woo! Please hold your applause. We shall begin proceedings. I am Chris and I am going to share a screen with you now. Um, and what we're going to do today is really uh, delve into what has been the magic of School of Code over the last 16 weeks for 22 wonderful people. And we are going to see them live present all of their hard work. So uh, let me share my screen here. And we will begin. So let me just make sure that's the right screen. Bum, bum, bum. Okay. So School of Code, demo day, welcome. This is actually our third demo day, our first ever remote demo day. And it is going to be fun because Correct. today, hello. Sorry, just move your settings. It's, it's in front of the... Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Very cool. You see that now? Smashing. There we go. So, the first of many technical difficulties today, placed purposefully right at the start so we can get out of the way. Um, cool. So, well, welcome to the third demo day. This is our first ever remote demo day, so it is going to be fun because today's all about... Um, 22 brave people that embarked on this coding journey 16 weeks ago. 16 of the longest weeks of their lives, uh, for sure. But uh, I can't believe it's come around so quickly. Um, they've all made the leap into technology coming from uh, a massive range of backgrounds. Most of them have never seen a line of code before. Um, and uh, now we'll just see how far they've got in such a short space of time. So the course is 16 weeks long and the last four weeks are all working on their final team projects, which is what you're going to have demoed to you here today. Um, so I'm Chris. Uh, I started the School of Code to try and help get more and different types of people into technology because I could see all the opportunity in tech, as I'm sure we're all aware, um, but it wasn't reaching everyone because tech isn't just the future. It's, uh, it's very much the present because software is eating the world. Um, and, you know, what we've got is a massive tech skills gap. Um, the world has been facing a tech skills issue for quite some time now. We need 125,000 developers each year in the UK. Um, and people find it hard to leap over that chasm between where they start and getting tech jobs. There's a distinct lack of diversity in the industry. Um, the pipeline for talent only really works for a select few people. Um, and furthermore, there's rising automation, a change in job landscape, and digital literacy means, you know, something different to what it meant before. It's no longer, you know, knowing how to use Microsoft Word and Excel. It's knowing how to manage and interact with very complex systems. Um, and so some of the jobs, you know, we've seen over the past sort of 50 years are going to be disappearing forever. And new jobs will take their place, but we're going to need a massive national retraining scheme to, to try and upskill people from wherever they're working at the moment to become, you know, contributors to the tech industry. Um, but unfortunately, there's a there's a massive disconnect between academia and existing education systems and uh, the industry, the tech industry, which means that computer science actually, despite being the most in demand skill, um, as a degree, it has the highest unemployment rate out of any degree, which is crazy, but just shows, you know, how far off um, current institutions are, are producing talent compared to what um, industry needs. And so what we've done is create 16 weeks of intensive School of Code training with the School of Code Bootcamp. So it's team based, project driven, industry led and uh, just a massive transformational journey to get people from absolute scratch all the way through to professional developer and help them into their first tech jobs. And it's absolutely free. So why is it free? Well, there's, there's uh, 
boot camps out there already. Um, they usually cost on average £10,000, which means they're not really open to many different types of people. Um, and they stack a ton of prerequisites before you even apply. So most you have to do around 300 hours of work before you've even been uh, accepted into the application process. And in fact, 50% of the attendees of other boot camps are already professional developers of some sort. They're just looking to upskill in a different language. So it's a really smart business model, but for me, not really adding much value. It's not really solving the problem um, or helping you know, different types of people. So as I said, you know, this mass massive national retraining scheme we need to help the population transition to you know, uh, where the world is going. Um, that's not solved in, in anything that we've seen so far. And that's why we came up with the School of Code. We try and blend teamwork, soft skills, project management, presentation skills, and underpin those with just a selection of tech skills to really bring out some well-rounded tech talent that comes from just a range of different backgrounds. So the reason we, uh, we put the School of Code on is to to get people into jobs. And when you're hiring for positions, what I'd uh, ask you to do is really think about something called learning trajectory. So here we see you know, skill and time on the, on the axis. And over time, people's skills generally get better. But what you really wanna see when you're hiring people is hungry learners. Like what have they accomplished? How long have they been coding? And uh, that should really give you an indication of how quickly they can ramp up their skills. And as you'll hopefully see from today, the, the people that joined the School of Code, these brave boot campers, um, have really ramped up their skills massively in such an intense short period of time that you can just imagine where you could you know, take their skills to if they're learning just specifically for your companies or on your tech stacks. Um, because the School of Code really represents something, um, a shift in technology really. Um, modern software development is really a team sport. Uh, everyone might have their individual jobs, but if you aren't a team player, the whole thing goes nowhere. And understanding how to contribute in a high performance team is, is really critical to success. Um, and to be an effective team uh, and a, an effective team member, you have to appreciate all the different parts of the game. So we've covered such a huge scope of stuff in the last 16 weeks. It's going to be exciting to show you just what the uh, boot campers have uh, done with it in the last four in their projects. Um, and, you know, that team looks a bit more like a family in School of Code. So here's a here's a family of meerkats. Um, and, you know, that's what we've become. And uh, you're going to see how they delve into, you know, agile team working and really have that tech team high performance mentality. Um, because what we want to produce is not just curriculum zombies, which is what the, the current education system provides, which is just, you know, passing exam after exam and just learning, you know, for the sake of it almost. But never really getting to grips or, or changing mindset to uh, to facilitate the sort of growth that technology needs. What, what we try and produce is collaborative, creative thinkers, um, you know, the thinkers for the future, because you want people that can working teams, collaborate, communicate with technical and non-technical people, um, people that have hunger and resilience in problem solving, resilience in learning, and the drive and skills to push through any barriers and problems that they face. So our aim is to add value and to get more and different types of people into the industry. Um, and so we make sure to remove as many barriers as possible. As I said, it's completely free and there are no prerequisites. Now, most people, when they hear it's a free boot camp, think, OK, uh, what's the catch? Like, where's the scam? Um, and really, there, there isn't one. We want it to be free for learners because we feel like it shouldn't matter how much money you have. Um, and that should not dictate the opportunities, especially educational and job opportunities that, that are presented to you. So we want to open that up and just make sure more different and every type of person can get through and, and benefit from technology. Most people that come on board, as I said, have never seen a line of code before. So how do we make it free? Well, we partner with supporters and sponsors. So we have um, the WMCA this time, the West Midlands Combined Authority, that are supporting us and helping us deliver this program of uh, massive transformational change. And when we place people into jobs, 
at the end of the course, when employers hire from us, um, we actually ask for a recruitment pledge, which is a hiring fee, which makes sure that we're sustainable and can run another boot camp and another boot camp and hopefully, you know, become a talent pool for the region um, because it's much needed. And, uh, you know, the results that we uh, are going to show you today, hopefully will show you why we think we can really help many, many more people there. So let's just have a quick look at what the School of Code has been so far. Here's cohort one the original experiment. So a social experiment taking 20 random people, chuck them in a room and seeing if we can teach them to code and get them jobs at the end of 16 weeks. Um, we went to cohort two um, and uh, again, trying to prove if that experiment was a, a fluke or not. And from those two uh, initial experiments, um, we've seen people come from a massive range of backgrounds. So we've got everything from uh, return to work parents, warehouse workers, um, hospitality workers, um, unemployed people, musicians, artists, uh, a sheep shearer. Um, what else have we got? E everything you can think of, people from theatre, people from uh, school leavers, everything you can think of. Um, we've had to come through the course, um, which really proves that, you know, tech talent can come from everywhere if it's given the right opportunity. And up till now, we've had uh, 900 plus applications for those two cohorts previously, um, an age range of 18 to 63, a 50-50 gender split. Um, and we've managed to um, get 90% employment into full-time tech opportunities, which is, uh, you know, massive uh, success and really attributed to the, the people that we've brought on who from absolute scratch have changed their lives and are now fully immersed in tech as a career really. Which brings us to the beautiful bunch of people that we're going to explore um, what they've been up to today, uh, cohort three. So um, for cohort three, we had 1500 applications. Um, again, a massive range of ages, 50-50 gender split. And so, you know, we're hoping to see how many of them we can help change their lives, get into tech careers and uh, get into companies that they can really help drive forward and that they fit really well into. So in terms of demographics, um, the demographics of Birmingham, uh, where we're based, are, are really diverse. Um, and, you know, because we've removed bias out of the application process, um, they pretty much reflect perfectly the demographics of our, of our boot camp, which is, um, you know, just goes to show more and different types of people are interested in getting into tech. There's just not enough credible paths for them to take. And, uh, you know, over the past couple of boot camps, we've uh, had our boot campers recognized in the press and um, winning awards all over the place. So we're really proud of what they've gone on to achieve, not just on the boot camp, but afterwards helping drive companies forward and, you know, really contribute into the tech economy. But we've had a massive shock to the system in terms of uh, coronavirus um, in this cohort, um, something unexpected to contend with. Um, and it threw a real spanner into the works uh, for everyone across the world. Um, and in many cases, the world just stopped. Uh, so the economy stopped, lockdown, furloughs, um, uncertainty in many industries. People have had a lot to contend with, which brings us to the working from home, because uh, for the last eight weeks, um, we have been running the School of Code remotely. So not only have people come from absolute scratch to, to learn code, but they've also halfway through that been shifted to completely remote working patterns. Um, and as I said, the last four weeks of the projects, so their very first real project in tech has been 100% distributed teams, 100% remote. Um, so it's going to be really interesting today um, how, we, uh, how, we've, how we see them manage that problem and, and overcome it. Um, cool. So um, what I'd like to do uh, is introduce our teams, really. Um, now, despite, you know, everything they've had to contend with, um, you know, Demo Day is a, is a tradition for School of Code. It's a rite of passage um, for boot campers, and it's a chance to really see what their skills and personalities are. But usually we do live demos in, a, in an in-person, you know, arena. And last time we held it in a cinema. And there's a really good vibe and, you know, um, everyone in this room right now, everyone in this webinar is really supportive of the boot campers. Um, but obviously the, the remote nature of Demo Day, the tech challenges there for live demos is just uh, ridiculous, right? 
Um, so I've listened to a lot of feedback and it was obviously going to be, you know, uh, not a sensible ask to do live demos. But I've ignored all that advice because this is the school of code. OK, we fly in the face of sensible. And so all the demos today are 100 percent live. Anything could happen. They've only been working on these projects for four weeks. So, um, you know, bear that in mind. And, you know, everyone's here to support. Everyone understands what live demos are. So if anything goes wrong, you know, um, that's part and parcel of uh, what we've chosen to do here today. But it will make it exciting and fun. And you'll really see a warts and all version of um, our teams, their skills and, and what they can produce. So without further ado, uh, I am going to uh, stop sharing my screen. And we're going to bring in the first, um, the very first team today, which is going to be Team Joe Mellon, which is uh, the Bootcamp Community App team. So, whilst we wait to get them in, uh, let's uh, let's see who we've got. Hey, Mel. Hiya. How are you doing? We've got Jody. Hello. And very soon we should have Helen. Hello. Great. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, pass over to you guys. So um, as soon as you're ready, take it away. Thank you for the lovely introduction, Chris. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Demo Day. We are Team Joe Mellon, and this is our presentation for our Boot Camp and Network app. My name is Mel. I used to work part time in fast food while I was at college learning IT, which unfortunately taught me nothing. So now I'm finally here living my dream learning to code. Hi, I'm Helen. I worked as a primary school teacher for the past 10 years, but I just completely lost the love for the job. I decided to take the brave leap back to tech, which was my first love, to challenge myself to learn to code and turn it into a career. Hi, I'm Jodie. I used to manage projects in higher education, but decided it was time for a change. So I'm here looking for a new challenge in tech. So this is the problem that we were faced with. The School of Code is growing rapidly from a Chris Mere experiment to, in our biased opinion, the best way to transform people into top tech talent and change lives. However, now there is a much larger community of boot campers, alumni and mentors to manage and engage. The, com the community is currently spread across various social media platforms and boot campers have no real easy way to access the support available from previous cohorts. It takes time to find School of Code alumni online and new boot campers can feel slightly disconnected from alumni as you have to request their connection on platforms such as LinkedIn. We as boot campers feel we have no easy way of knowing what companies are affiliated with the School of Code or which ones that previous boot campers work for, other than when they come in for guest lectures. We also know that after the boot camp, Chris and the team like to follow the boot campers to keep up with them, see how things are going and try to support them in any way they can. However, rather than messaging everyone individually, there's not a particularly easy way to do so. So here is the solution we've come up with. We are bringing you the solution. Um, it is our Boot Camper Network app and we are demonstrating it through the medium of Deborah McCode. Now, Debbie has just found out that she secured a very much coveted place on the fourth School of Code Boot Camper cohort. She's received an email inviting her to join the Boot Camper Network app. She's very excited. She navigates to the link and finds that she can download the app to her home screen, so she does. She clicks login and she's redirected to a Google signing page. As she's a new user, she's asked to create a profile, which she does. She fills in all her details. She pops in that she's a School of Code aspiring developer. She used to work in McDonald's as a crew member and she pops in her social links. She can then save that and see her profile immediately. She then navigates to the dashboard. She spots the latest, this very kind message from the School of Code team. She scrolls through some tweets from School of Code and hashtag School of Code, which are retweeted by our Twitter bot. She also notices the app displays a tech event. Debbie is very excited about getting into the local tech scene. So she decides to look up some events in her area. She browses the up-to-date list that's fetched from the Meetup API and finds one she's interested in. So she clicks the link to sign up immediately. Debbie then decides to browse a few of the School of Code affiliated companies. She clicks through to the profiles of a company she's interested in. 
she's excited because she spots that on the map, this company is actually quite close to where she lives. She notices she can see alumni who work at this company, so she clicks through to their profile and decides to send the boot camper an email with a few questions. So it's a few months later now, and during the course, Deb realizes that she's really into UX and she wants to find out more about the role. She uses the filtered search to find other past boot campers who are in UX roles so she can contact them with a few questions. She pops a message into the group chat too, to ask for some advice. Oh, hello, Chris. Um, Thanks, Chris. It's a couple of years later and Deb has loved her first role in tech, but decides now that she's ready for a change. She goes to her profile and updates her job satisfaction rating. Chris, who is an admin for the app, is now able to see on his dashboard that Deb is interested in a new role, and so he can reach out to her and offer help. Before she logs off, she has a browse of the boot campers that use the app and is very impressed by the very tech roles that they're all in. And that concludes the demonstration of our boot camper network app. So, in our ideation phase, we listed all of the features that our app could include. We then put this into our user feedback form that we circulated to current and past boot campers. We then used their feedback to come up with our minimum viable product. This ensured that the app was user driven from the start. From our feedback, we decided on what, would we, what we'd include in our MVP. We decided to include Bootcamper profiles. We wanted to include a filtered search based on job role, name, company, cohort, and region. We decided to bring local tech events from the Meetup API. We wanted a list of companies. We wanted the login functionality, and we decided to build a progressive web app so that it could be used online and offline on web browsers and Android or iOS devices. We met our MVP within our second sprint, so we then moved on to our stretch, stretch goals of included group, sorry, including group messaging, company profiles, and an admin dashboard. We had several stages to our process, and the first of which was creating a user persona so that we could use it to see how someone like Deborah, as you just saw, might want to use our app. We had three stages of wireframing, and each stage was a better iteration compared to the last, leading up to the most recent iteration, which you just saw on the demo. The first stage, we planned the original look and feel of the app, the pages it would have, and the functionality of those. In stage two, we used the Figma prototyping to plan out how a user would click through the app to get to the different pages and how they would interact with each other. And in stage three, we decided on a new design for the app to make it match a little bit better how we wanted to look. And since then, as you've seen, we made it even better. We knew from the start that we'd be using databases and planned out how some of the tables would connect so that we could pull information from each one and how they would do that. We did this with an entity relationship diagram that we drew on Lucidchart. And we used the GitHub project board to plan it out so we had a clear idea of what needed to be done and when. And instead of the usual Fibonacci sequence story pointing, we used t-shirt sizes because it made more sense to us and helped us see exactly which issues would take more time and which sprints they needed to be done in. And we worked in sprints of five days to make sure we were on track with the project board. We also deployed early and got some of the boot campers to test the app, put their information in and give us feedback on what needed improving and how they felt about the app as a whole. For our tech stack, we decided to use React as I feel at this point we know it quite well and we knew we could use it to make a great app. Initially, we did experiment with using React Native, but we felt that because it would have split the code base across iOS, Android and web, we decided to just use React and make it a PWA. We went with a progressive web app because it's installable onto home pages for both desktop and mobile, which allowed us to have a single code base that was usable across all devices. This has benefits both in terms of a consistent user experience, but also the development and maintenance of the software. We use sockets for our chat feature because it handles broadcasting really well, thanks to the bi-directional communication layer. We could also use it with our Firebase authentication to go on to develop a private messaging feature. For our back end, we chose to use Amazon Web Services RDS to host our PostgreSQL database and Amazon's um, Elastic Beanstalk to host our back end. 
Elastic Beanstalk is an orchestration service offered by AWS for deploying applications by bringing together various AWS resources. We chose to use AWS for a few different reasons. Firstly, we decided that we'd actually want to challenge ourselves to learn a little bit more about AWS as we only scratched the service, so surface on the bootcamp. Secondly, it enabled us to set up CICD for our backend within the first week and deploy changes to the cloud instantly. And third, we were actually able to configure an application load balancer within Elastic Beanstalk. So if Chris's bootcamp world domination plans actually pan out, the app will automatically scale with the huge amount of traffic that we are expecting it to have in the coming years. We chose to set up our user authentication with Firebase as it gave us an easy method to authenticate users into our app with their Google accounts and it gave us access to the user data to begin populating their profiles. We feel that we've had many successes, challenges and learning opportunities throughout the build of our app. Um, one of our main successes we feel is that we've actually been able to pick up a few new technologies that we didn't cover on the bootcamp, such as using Amazon Web Services, um, RDS Elastic Beanstalk, PWAs and using the OAuth 2 to interface with our Meetup API. We were able to learn about these and implement them into our app successfully. A challenge was we dynamically pulled events from the Meetup API, which we had to interface with using the OAuth strategy. This took us longer than we anticipated. And if we were to do it again, we would consider the time we put into this against the data we got back. And we would explore if there were quicker ways we could have done this to achieve the same result. I think one of the most important things that we learned to, how to do was to work efficiently as a remote team. Coming into the course, we had absolutely no idea that the entire last half of it would be remote, but we adapted well to the unfortunate circumstances and made it work. I also think that working remotely opened up a lot of opportunities for us as we used software we may not have used in person, such as Figma, which we used to overcome the fact that being remote meant we were unable to draw up the wireframe designs in person, but it also meant we were able to quickly and easily change and iterate the designs to make them better as we work through the project. Our next steps are to use the chat feature that we've built and combine it with our Firebase authentication to develop private messaging functionality, like I mentioned earlier. We also want to integrate push notifications to alert boot campers of messages and requested updates on the app. We're confident that we can build these in the next five days. Give it two more weeks to do this, we would absolutely set up a way for events to be planned on the app instead of just having Birmingham related events from the Meetup API. Also, we'd have a job opportunities board that advertises jobs from the SOC related companies that boot campers can look into and apply for. Thank you everybody for listening. Our socials are on screen if you wish to reach out to us. Thank you. Woo. Nice. Good stuff, guys. Uh, so, um, amazing presentation because this is weird, right? So like, I feel like I'm screaming at pigeons in the park uh, <laughs> in that there's no response, but you, you guys coped really well with that. So. Um, well done. Uh, I'm just going to go to the Q&A for a second. So what was the most challenging part of the process for you? I think um, we talked a little bit about the challenges, but I, I think everyone would probably agree the OAuth 2 for the Meetup API. It, was, it wasn't a very nice process. We got through it in the end together. Um, but I think, like Jodie said, we probably didn't look into exactly how much we would get back for the time we, we put into doing it. So um, it was a pretty tricky thing to get our heads around. Yeah, we definitely didn't anticipate having to jump through quite so many hoops just to get some events back from the Meetup API. Without so, even a picture. Yeah, that was a challenge. Okay, nice. And uh, you mentioned you investigated React Native. Mm -hmm. So um, how far did you get into that and what, what did you learn? Um, so we basically started the project in React Native um, because I'd done a little bit of experimenting on a side project with it and I thought we could do it. Um, but it's much more fiddly than React and it's got some differences, like it's got no DOM and it's got a split code base. So it's like um, you've got to have different code for iOS, Android and web. And it meant having to go through app stores. So we decided to just make it a PWA because it's got a lot more flexibility to it. Um, like Android, iOS and web all in one thing and you can see online or offline without having to go through the app store stuff. Great. 
Okay, cool. Well, uh, I think you've done amazingly well. Looking forward to uh, using that. And bonus points on mentioning me three times in your presentation. That's obviously well, given you the, the gold <laughs> staff so far. So uh, yeah, round of applause for that team. And uh, yeah, Ben, should we should we get the next team in? So um, I forgot to mention because I do. I feel like I'm screaming into a microphone here. I forgot to mention that uh, if you have got questions, stick them in the Q and A. Um, we're going to have around 10, 15 minute presentations and going to try and squeeze some questions in at the end. But we're going to keep today's session as short as possible because um, by default, even though you're all lovely people, you are now internet people and internet people have a notoriously short attention span. So we're going to squeeze all this into two hours and uh, just go back to back and uh, look at hopefully a massive variety of projects um, and see exactly how far each team has come. So the next team up is, uh, has been making SOC Wars. So School of Code Wars. So it's a, a multiplayer game. Uh, you guys ready? We are. Yeah, okay, yeah I'm I'll ready. I'll hand over to you. Perfect. Hello everybody and thank you for coming to our demo day. We are Team Bump. I am Cheryl, used to manage dentists in London. I joined the School of Code to finally have a career in tech. Hello everyone, uh, my name is James, James Gregus. I used to be a primary school teacher but um, became quite disillusioned with that so thought I could uh, affect the next generation of people through technology instead. Hey everyone, my name is Ter. I used to be a family social worker. I got into that job because I wanted to help people and I'd still like to do that, but I want to do it through code instead. Hello everyone, I'm Vinny. I used to be a Brazilian, but now I'm doing my best to code better than I can joke. Great. So as we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has hit us. It has confined us to our homes and limited our interactions with our friends and family. People are now turning towards technology and the internet to stay connected with one another. So as a team, we wanted to come up with a solution that would be that would bring us together, that would be fun and enjoyable. And what better way to do that than a multiplayer online game? So before we started our journey to create the game, we wanted it to be engaging for different range of people, regardless of age and technical ability. We wanted it to be played remotely, given our current situation. And thirdly, we wanted to encompass technology that would make us possible to play the game online. Uh, we researched a few browser multiplayer games that found, uh, and found this uh, IO trend, which, is, which fits the idea that we wanted quite nicely. Because it's uh, just a bunch of easy games where you put your name in and you hit play and you're having fun with uh, players all, all over the world. Yeah, so let's look at uh, user personas for a second. We had a look at quite a few, but the one we really concentrated on here, as you can see, is Billy, a student, probably around about 18 years old, probably quite computer literate. His, probably main, his main priority here is gonna be to have fun, to make other people in a nice, safe environment, and to be able to play online, given the current circumstances but we also made sure we looked at other people as well maybe people a little bit older maybe not quite as computer savvy but still want to go online still want to keep in contact with family members so that's why we thought it important to make it as simple as possible but also maybe have functionality for different rooms that people could go into so they could play alongside other people that they actually knew as well so let's have a look at our mvp so we knew we wanted to create a game. We knew we wanted to create a game that had a narrative, was clear, and that people would be invested in. So they knew exactly what was going on and could become engrossed in this. We wanted people to have a choice of character, which is why we put in five, which we'll see in just a second, so they could personalise their experience. We wanted to make sure as well that people could interact with other people in the game, but also see what, how other people in the game were acting, re interacting excuse me, with other people as well. So we needed to make sure we had some kind of information at the top. We needed to make sure there was an end point to the game. So we wanted to make sure that there was a time limit on there or somehow you could be knocked out by um, losing life or, or something like that. And finally, we wanted to make sure this was going to be online and was going to be reliable. So we need to make sure that our service is reliable and that we'll be able to have a number of people playing the game at the same time. So the next thing we looked at was user experience. And we used Figma in order to um, create a wireframe for our possible game. We knew we wanted to start with a video 
And then uh, that would explain exactly how the game was going to work. And then we would have a choice of characters that we could put into there. And then finally, straight into the game. What we didn't want to do, and we consciously, uh, consciously chose not to have any kind of sign in, for example, with emails, because people might not want to do that if they're playing a game. They want to get stuck in straight away. So that's what we did. So let's, uh, let's have a quick look at that game, shall we, Tay? Yep, there it is. So this is our first page, our initial page. And as you can see, as I just said a few minutes ago, we wanted people to understand exactly how the game was going to be played and make it as simple as possible. So we based it around the School of Code. It's all to do with Chris and the School of Code people playing against each other. It explains the rules, it explains how the game works, it explains how you can level up or how you can be knocked out of the game. And it's nice and simple to use all in one video. When we press the start button, it takes us to these three rooms. The purpose of these rooms were to limit players to each room that would enhance their experience in the game. These rooms are customizable with different backgrounds and different time limits. Uh, the React front end that you see here, uh, we, we chose React because of its flexibility and it's uh, because it's one of the, the things we've been taught at the boot camp. Uh, React Frontend emits everything that the game uh, server needs to know about uh, like the player you picked and the character, uh, the name you picked for yourself. Yeah, we talked quite a lot about the different game mechanics that we can include to make the game fun and accessible. And we decided on this five-way rock, paper, scissors interaction between the players uh, because we wanted people to sort of feel the highs and lows of being strong and vulnerable at different points in the game. Um, so I'm going to be playing as Ben, so clearly I've got to watch out for Mr. Chris Mir there. Mm -hmm. So as you can start, Teo, uh, as you can see, excuse me, uh, Teo has gone into the game. At this point in time, the Canvas uh, component it now contains all the information that's going to be able to run this game for him. Um, who are you? You're, you're, you're Ben, are you, Teo? Uh, yeah, well, so you've of... seen who I'm playing as, have you, James? And you're going to yeah, 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 I'm checking out already. Are you in room two? <laughs> Room two, yeah. I'm coming in. As we are waiting for James to join Taylor, I would like to tell you that we used request animation frame, which calls our game loop at the speed of browser refresh rate and re-renders it, optimizing the game for the player. You can also see that if the oh, character is oh. not up against the wall, uh, it's centered around the uh, on the screen, in the middle of the screen. And that goes for any resolution that the user has. So it's responsive. Yeah, uh, we also want, we, we thought the social aspect of the game was really important, which is why we've got those events up there at the top uh, to show the players, even if you can't see them on the screen, you can see what your friends are doing. Yeah, so the point of the game here is to get as many points as you can. You might see there are some school of code icons around the place. So collecting those will increase your score, which can be taken away. And that's shown on the scoreboard at the end of the game as well. I'm gonna get me. Another wonderful feature that we added was the players could collide with each other and get points from one another. As we can say, maybe Chris is running after Teo oh. and trying to bump into him. Uh, in this game, um, Chris is stronger than ben, ben, unfortunately. Um, so this was one way of winning the game if the timer doesn't run out. Uh, the game is constantly uh, trying to, uh, calculating the distance between each player so that when the distance between two players is less than the sum of the radius, the game detects a collision. Yeah, one of the most, uh, <laughs> one of the most difficult aspects of the game, as you could probably see from that demo, was implementing realistic 2D elastic collisions between the players. Um, so the coordinates of each player aren't just changed in the background when you press a key but we're taking into account acceleration, friction, uh, velocity and mass to determine how they move and react to each other. So small players should ping off larger players who should remain relatively still. And if you change uh, just a few variables in the background, you can make players feel like they're skating on ice or trudging through mud. Looks like I won that game, guys. Yeah, never mind. Get you next time. <laughs> Uh, planning had a huge role in our project because it enabled us to keep track whether we were ahead or behind schedule. And so that way, that way we could make uh, adjustments in our sprint reviews. And as you can see on our Trello board, we used the ticket and point system to determine priority and difficulty of each ticket to align with the agile way of working. 
the feedback has been an essential part for our game as well. Once our MVP was created, we gave it out to the group to demo. We made sure we got continual feedback and made sure we made amendments according to the feedback immediately. So although we used a bunch of technologies to make this game, WebSockets and Canvas were the two key ones that we learned. So Canvas allowed us to render our graphics in real time, whilst WebSockets allowed us that real time rendering to be shared between our players. We did look at game frameworks like Pixie.js, Phaser and Unity as well. But after some experimentation with those, we decided that the custom game methods that they gave us, whilst really powerful, um, didn't provide us with the same learning opportunity as building the game from scratch in plain JS. So for instance, we probably could have imported a physics engine to use in the game, but instead we learned a lot more by writing it ourselves. Um, and then also, yeah, our React Canvas front end. There are quite a few documented examples of this, but it definitely didn't feel like something which loads of people have done. Um, but ultimately the power of React allowed us to have a really smooth player experience before and after each game. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, initially we thought a mono repo uh, would best suit the WebSocket game because the back end and the front end are actually really closely linked through the flow of events happening in the background. But when it came to deployment, we decided the combination of Heroku and Netlify would allow us to quickly test how each iteration of the game played online so we could focus on its development. Um, as early testing was integral to developing the game, we split the mono repo into a front end and a back end in our first sprint so that we could deploy it. And it was also a massive opportunity to become familiar with using uh, microservice architecture on a daily basis. Yeah, th thanks, Ter. So uh, if we analyze what we've learned in the past four weeks, we've come up with three main things. One of them was when to know when to work individually or as pairs or when to mob program as well. Um, obviously, given the current situation, we haven't actually physically been in the same room as each other for well, quite a few weeks now and definitely all of this project. So when to work in these particular formats was really important. When we started off and we were looking at the canvas and sockets, we tended to work quite a lot mob programming so we could make sure we understood everything that was going on, understand exactly how the structure worked. But then when we started putting the front end on with React, for example, we then paired off or worked individually to make sure we could work on different components and, and then push those up so we could uh, keep on working on it. Uh, another thing we, we learned a lot about was agile working, um, especially remotely as well. So every day we had stand-ups, we made sure that we looked at the successes from the day before and what needs we had for the day uh, we were going into. We made sure we worked in two week sprints and we kept on reviewing these and making sure that we were getting feedback from the cohort, they were playing the game and making sure that we could add extra features onto those and working to a deadline of four weeks, which, which pretty much culminates now actually. And finally, GitHub. Um, we've been using it for a long time now, but it's been so important as version control over the past few weeks. Um, we've been solving conflicts, making sure that obviously we're pushing all those things up and pulling down and working in parallel work streams to make sure that we can continue to get everything uh, working correctly, despite the fact that we're not actually in the same room. So yeah, some really important things that we've learned. Uh, we have arranged our stretch goals in, in, in this timeline according to the experience we have acquired during the project and with one extra week for each branch on the timeline, as you can see. So uh, in, in a, a week from now, we'll have the ability for players to choose their character physics. Uh, players will be able to create their own groups to play with their family or, or friends. Uh, two weeks from now, we'll have a chat function between players because that's something done with uh, WebSockets and we have done this on the bootcamp before, so it wouldn't be too much of a stretch. We'll also have the ability to, for you to upload your own character to play with, with it. Uh, three weeks from now, we'll have created different game modes for, for you to have fun with, uh, like the infected or playing catch, and even the ability to level up your characters. Thanks very much for listening, everyone. Yes, thanks a lot. And thanks to everyone who helped us on the project as well. Big shout out. Okay, nice work, guys. Thank you. Uh, so, um, I like how you said uh, we've been using it for a long time, uh, GitHub. It feels like a long time, doesn't it? <laughs> it feels like a long, long time. <laughs>
It does. <laughs> it's because uh, you're talking so well, Chris. It's been a um, while in dark years. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so let's let's go to the Q and A uh, for a minute. So React and Canvas, um, you said that wasn't a, a well trodden path. It didn't um, feel like it, no. Okay, so what what were the what were the issues there, or what did you what did you explore there? Yeah, it's an interesting question. We we solved it quite early on, um, but but basically because a React we have a Canvas component. And if we weren't careful, that was going to re-render whenever state changed. Uh, so what we had to do was we had to use um, a use ref hook um, in to pass that canvas our game loop so that the canvas was able to update using that request animation frame, um, but not didn't actually contain any state. So it would re remain, well, just render once as soon as you start the game. OK, Anything nice. you wanted to add to that, guys? I think, I think that was it. Yeah, that's yeah, about it. Yeah, I did pretty much. Okay. Um, okay, I'm just checking the chat for some more because uh, some people found the Q&A. I don't think everyone has. Um, how did uh, how did you engage with your stakeholders in research? Like, how did you, who did you research and how did you get the research out and how useful was it? So, yeah, we, um, we've we tried as much as we could. So we put ours on Netlify and Heroku, um, which was relatively easy at first, but then kept on breaking a little bit. So we did have to keep on going over it. But um, the boot campers have been brilliant in order to be able to keep on testing this. And not just boot campers, I've actually handed it to my family and I think other people have handed it to people they've known as well. So we've made sure we, one of the things we wanted to do quite early was get this online as soon as possible. So we actually started off with the game without actually the five characters and our initial sort of pre-MVP was actually the idea of a character being able to uh, take points away from another one actually by having more points than them because we thought this would be quite easy to sort out. And we put this out to boot campers and gave it a try. And from there, we were then able to add more features and then develop onto that. So, um, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, it, it just meant that we could constantly get feedback and constantly be able to work out what was the next thing we needed to work on and make sure it was working properly. Perfect. Well, uh, congratulations again, guys. Uh, take a big, big sigh of relief now. Uh, you know. So uh, obviously building the game from scratch, you know, um, hard to do, but you learn a lot through that process. And uh, yeah, cool. Nice. OK, round of applause. And... Um, Let's uh, line up the next team, who will be Team uh, Energize. So um, just while we line them up, I'm going to uh, have a little look at um, what we can do here in terms of, um, well, there's, there's always been a big question about can the School of Code scale? And uh, people have often said, you know, the only way to, um, to really scale it is... Uh, no, not right now, thanks. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, the, the only way to really scale um, School of Code in any meaningful way is, is going to be to to clone me. Uh, no, I said, just put it down there. For God's sake. Thanks. Uh, I did need a drink, actually. Um, yeah, and, and so obviously that is is not all benefits. You know, cloning is a very hard... Pro God damn it. Um, Jesus Christ, give me one second, guys. Sorry, Sarah, the clones have got out again. Yeah, just stick them back. <sighs> anyway, uh, anyway, so cloning is not uh, something that is easy, uh, lots of mistakes. Clones don't know how to shave. All of this sort of stuff, they're not very effective. So um, actually, we've sort of proven it by uh, Ben taking the lead. So Ben was a boot camper on the last cohort. So he's only been coding for a year. And he's actually uh, led this boot camp um, as a teacher, um, really got to grips with um, teaching himself, but at the same time, driven this cohort forward. And uh, sort of left me twiddling my thumbs, really, and thinking what my purpose is in life because he's done better than me in a year. But anyway, uh, so that's that's good. So it proves that we've got a, a model that not just produces tech talent, but you know we can we can grow our own to, to help really expand. And uh, that's what we're gonna try and do, help as many different types of people as we can um, over the coming years. So 
Team Energize. Are we ready? We are. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to you. Take it away. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let me just get my Zoom all sorted. There we go. Um, so we're Team Energize. Um, I'm Liv and I've been a stay at home mum for the past five years, uh, but I'm ready to get back to the workforce now and I want to show my daughter that women can code. Hi, I'm Sam Dent. Um, before this, I was actually a healthcare assistant in the NHS, um, but I joined School of Code because I feel like if you really want to change the world, then tech is the industry to be in. Hi, my name is Yasmin. Um, prior to School of Code, I used to work as a data manager in clinical trials, but I want a career in tech so I can have more impact and imp improve healthcare. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Grace. I used to teach science to inner city kids um, and then carried on working with young people in the nonprofit sector. And I'm really inspired by the potential of tech to create social change. So those are our official profiles, but we are quite unique uh, as a foursome because we have got some unofficial helpers. We're all parents. And that means that the situation with COVID-19 has meant as well as being full-time developers, we've also been balancing very full family lives at the same time. Uh, but we've adapted by embracing what we like to call asynchronous working. And um, basically that means working at different times of the day or the night. Um, it's actually become our secret weapon though. It's sharpened all of our project management skills, particularly our communication skills. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to present our progressive web app. So given the brief to build an Energizer app or an app for short and sweet team activities, we saw that the big problem that we could solve was the productivity killing 3 p.m. slump that you can see there. Um, and studies actually confirm that 2.55 p.m. is the least productive time in offices all around the world. So this is something that we've all felt, we've all been beaten by it, and we've all caffeinated through it as well. In the UK alone, two million pounds a year is spent on producing energy drinks just to overcome this. So here we saw an opportunity, not just to solve the problem, but to do so in a way that would connect teams, improve mental health and spread joy, all in under 20 minutes. Energizers. So energizers are quick team building activities that increase productivity and energize groups. At the School of Code, we believe and have experienced that daily building of trust, shared experiences and fun through afternoon energizers leads to better and stronger teams. So we did some initial research and after that we developed some key personas to help us stay focused when we built the app. Uh, we decided to focus on a tech team, but we do think that our concept and approach could be scaled across any industry. So what are the current solutions that are available um, on the market? So here are some of the existing market solutions. Um, we found though that most of them were um, essentially glorified libraries of activities. Um, in general, they were quite hard to navigate, um, somewhat outdated and not very engaging. So this gave us some clues as to what our niche might be. So we were thinking, what if you could find an activity and then you had all the tools you needed to run it straight from one place? So you can make teams, keep scores and have fun. Suddenly all the cognitive load and effort of running an energizer is gone. And the solution to the 3 p.m. slump is accessible to teams everywhere. So with that in mind, we are introducing our solution, the three o'clock tippers. Um, and here's a live demo. So we are going to show you um, our demo via the medium of Ben, who's our core user. He's the team leader and he's very short on time. So we really wanted to focus in on something that's quick to use. So he's downloaded the app. He can see this call to action button in the middle, um, Energize Me Now. So he clicks on that. It takes him straight to an Energizer. Um, he has a little look at the instructions, but decides against that one. So he notices he can pick another and clicks that button. And Binny Pong sounds fun. He reads the instructions, notices how long it will take and clicks down at the bottom at these tools to help him run the activity. Um, and he notices he can make some teams. He can add in player names one at a time. And then rather than having to think of the teams himself, he can just set however many numbers of teams he wants and three o'clock to us will randomly uh, generate those teams for him, just take a bit of the load out. So once he's got his team set up, he can keep track of scores through whatever energizer he wants to run. And he can also 
if uh, you have a look at the top, there's a scoreboard feature. So at the end of the game, it just is a nice roundup of who's played and what they got. So on his next visit, Ben has a bit more time to plan and is curious about what else the app has to offer. He then looks through the, um, the information icon and sees um, the three main areas which have been explained. He then decides to look through the library for an activity and picks one which needs a bit more prep work. He further, he further explores the in-app features and finds that he can easily add a bit of drama and fun to the activity. And it's a resounding success. Everyone has had a good laugh and the team compliment him on his creativity. So it's midweek now um, and today's been quite a hectic day with meetings all day. So Ben wants a calmer activity to cater for the introverts in his team. Um, so he notices there's a filter function and he uses that to sort for all the activities, the spirit activities that can be done with small teams. Um, and then he spots yoga studio that intrigues him. So he clicks on that. Um, and scrolling down, he sees that there's actually an option to play that now because it's an in-app game. So he clicks there and it takes him to yin yoga. He decides to do a short session of one minute. <laughs> and just for the purposes of the demo, we'll do one second per pose. So there we are, the team has been guided through a speedy session of yin yoga. Okay, so by now Ben is becoming a bit more familiar with the app and he explores some of the more common features like the burger menu. So from here he can see links to the most useful areas of the app are immediately accessible to him. Um, he's really enjoyed the yoga session and the fact that it's all run from within the app. It takes away all the effort and he sees the Clocksbus Games link. So he heads there and he sees that there's a whole host of games that you can play right here and right now. So this is where we thought that the uh, mobile device really comes into its own and we can start making use of features like swiping on Articulate. We've got quizzes where you decide on teams and rounds and it's all very tactile, it's engaging and it's fun. So now he has explored the activities, Ben has an idea for, for his own energizer and discovers that he can upload his activity to the database, which will be shared with all users of the app. With other users adding their activities to the app, he is sure he won't be running out of ideas for energizers anytime soon. Okay, so from the very first use, our app uh, has taken all the effort out of organizing energizers. And the fact that it's quick and easy to use means that it's, uh, it can become a regular feature in the team's day. And so they can look forward to the activity rather than being beaten by the 3 p.m. slump. Right, so we'll just talk you through a little bit about how we built the app now. Yeah, so onto the tech behind it. Um, we decided that the best fit for our solution would be a progressive web app or PWA, um, since we wanted it available across a range of devices, um, particularly mobile. Um, we also didn't want our users to be dependent on a network to, get, to be able to get the most from it. Um, we investigated where to host our app, focusing on Amazon's S3 service and Netlify, and decided Netlify would be our best choice due to the fact that HTTPS and continuous integration and continuous deployment functionality come as standard. It was also more user-friendly. Um, also, wherever possible, we aim to use a DevOps approach in our build for automation, since less time maintaining infrastructure meant more time focusing on features to best serve our users. So we were really conscious about using microservices wherever possible, AWS, Netlify, Cloud Atlas, um, due to the fact that they're low cost and they're scalable. So this is key for planning in the future of our products. Um, I think we were really excited by exploring cloud engineering. Um, we found it amazing just to see how quickly you could build and deploy a RESTful API uh, with the serverless framework, for example, with just a few lines of code and a YAML file. So in our journey, we used a structured Disney ideation approach to arrive at a solution that was fun and best for purpose. 
Owing to the asynchronicity of the group, from the beginning, we set out to keep a really rigorous work structure. So we set a team manifesto and we standardised working conventions and procedural workflow. We had stand-ups every morning and they were really useful to help stay unified in our vision. But we also found it crucial to have contingency plans for when one of us maybe couldn't make coding that day for whatever reason. So we divided up tasks quite uh, closely. Uh, in a worst case scenario, then we could still deliver something really great as a team. We've been working to an agile methodology since starting the course. And so naturally we continued this into our project using short sprints um, as an opportunity to, to constantly review our product. So we found several technologies really helped us in the management of our project. For instance, we used GitHub for version control. Uh, we reviewed each other's work and kept separate branches of code to keep our work clean. Uh, but we also had to make some pretty heavy use of Pepper Pig. So this is our Trello board. And um, we found this Kanban style of project management really effective. Um, you can see we color coded and adapted our Trello board to suit our needs at every stage of the project. Um, so we use it to, for instance, communicate about specific issues and decisions um, and also to identify and remove blockers. Wireframing in Figma was really vital for us. Uh, we mapped out our ideas early and they, it gave us a reference point for our team. Um, we also found that user feedback on the wireframe helped us to iterate and advance the design. So this is our sprint one wireframe. All of our sprints then expanded on the functionality of this core MVP. Um, and we had this up and running within the first few days. So as we were trying to fill a gap in the market for a fun and interactive uh, user interface, um, we did spend time on the design. Um, we experimented with various color palettes um, and also created these original logos and icons, uh, which were designed to complement our brand. And here you can just see how the look of our app evolves as we iterate and add functionality. So Figma also allowed us to produce prototypes and this was really useful in carrying out user research um, and midway, midway user testing. Um, you can see some of the results of that here. Um, so for example, due to some of the accessibility feedback, we improved the contrast between the text and background and we also increased the text size. Um, but we were happy to find that overall the app was achieving its purpose of generating energizers in a fun and a uh, quick way. So this slide actually shows a heat map generated by website tracker Hotjar, which we thought was incredible, seeing how users were actually interacting with the app. Um, and this, along with focus group testing, helped us to refine the experience of the app. Um, now it actually interacts with the IndexedDB browser API so that some data is stored on a user's device. This was after early research showed that users wanted to keep teams and scores between sessions. So we believe in our product's ability to help teams and that, and that means that we have a clear vision for the future. So as you can see in our next sprint, it involves integration of a user system, delivering personalized features and building an ecosystem for the app, um, which can be grown with user engagement. Um, we also have a backend API setup for user data and we will be using Firebase to authenticate users and allow for third party sign in. So what have we learned? Um, well, we have found that planning is paramount to production success and that actually quantifying the time and energy of each task is quite difficult, but it's worth investing uh, the effort in. It just makes planning the sprints a bit more accurate. Um, this four week journey though has been one of continued accelerated growth. We've tackled lots of new technologies, our project management has been sharpened and we've also learned a lot about remote working. Um, but one thing we know for certain is that we can't wait to carry on with this journey into tech. Um, thank you so much to everybody who's helped with this leap so far. And thanks everybody for coming to listen to our demo today. Uh, that wraps up our demo. I will show you now our uh, social media details. So please look us up if you'd like to. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Woo! Nice. Okay. Good stuff, guys. Um, so just looking at the um, the chat here, uh, so I'll, I'll grab a few questions because there's a barrage of uh, people trying to download this app and use this app. So we'll have to quickly think of a business model to, to sustain our lifestyles. And uh, other than that, 
Um, there's a couple of questions, a few about um, how you coped in terms of working asynchronously and what that transition was. Um, because just to remind people, you know, this is <clears throat> not just working asynchronously and remotely, but it's after 12 weeks of learning to code, then doing a fully remote project. Um, it's, it's a massive ask. So how did you guys combine that as well as having to be full time parents? So we made really good use of our daily stand up. That was the only time of the day that we knew we were all committed to being online at the same time. So that was always quite a structured session. Um, does anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, I think the um, contingency planning. And so we assigned authority for areas of the app as well. So that in any case, um, if people weren't available, then the team could continue. So it's really important to have that team structure there that we could all refer to. We, we used um, wireframing to make sure like we could all visually see what we were building. So there was no like ambiguity with the communication. So we put more detail into that. Um, and Trello was just really good for like seeing at a glance who was doing what. We made sure that we were very clear about that. So we didn't need to always like communicate on Slack. We could see it on the Trello board. Sorry, mm -hmm. Andy, we were going to say. That's okay. And also generally speaking, because we, we've got children, um, anything can go wrong. We just had to make use of um, nap, nap, nap times and um, the times <laughs> that they're sleeping. So we've, um, always, had, <laughs> yeah, we've always had people um, online during the night time. So myself and Grace were the night owls and Sam and Liv were the early birds. So between us, there was someone probably awake like for 24 hours, just <laughs> we weren't all there at the same time. <laughs> 24 hours of coding what that's a party if there ever was one okay so uh really really good demo as well you mentioned serverless um what was the what was the biggest hurdle there and what you know why did you choose serverless what did you experience so we chose um to go serverless because of the way that it scales so easily um it means that the Lambda functions are only firing when being called. It's not going to, we're not going to be paying for sort of a service we're not using. Um, I think the biggest challenge there for us was writing those Lambda functions. First of all, it's a whole new syntax, um, but also integrating it with our database. Um, on the course, we had a look at SQL databases. So we wanted to challenge ourselves um, with a NoSQL database. So we went with Cloud Atlas. And just learning how to in integrate all of these microservices was a big challenge. But I think um, th if the course has taught us anything, it's to sort of engage with these problems head on and use them as like an opportunity for learning. Perfect. Okay, well, congratulations, guys. Looks great. And uh, another round of applause. Yes. So we will flow into the next team seamlessly. And that team is Docio or Doceo. I'll let them pronounce it uh, with their tuition management app. Um, but yeah, just to reiterate, um, you know, the coronavirus uh, situation meant that halfway through the course, we switched to uh, remote working. So for these guys to now, you know, be fully remote teams and have delivered this, I think is uh, incredible, really. So um, congratulations to, to all of them for getting something usable and uh, live demoing so far um, pretty seamlessly. Um, so we've got Doceo coming in, Doceo. Charlotte, how do you pronounce it? Docio. Docio. Okay, so none of the ways that I said it. Okay. Uh, so, Points for effort, though. Well, thanks. I'm nothing if not a trier. Um, cool. So uh, as soon as um, we've got your whole team in, we will uh, get ready to go. Um Let's just uh, remind people that the Q&A, there should be a button at the bottom, Q&A. You can pop your questions in there. It'd be easier for me to, uh, to grab them than from the chat. And uh, there's a hashtag SOC demo day. I don't know. You, uh, if, you, if you do stuff with hashtags, that's the hashtag to use. Um, cool. So you guys ready? Just waiting on Ravi, I think. Hi, I'm here. Ready to, ready to go. Okay, well, I'll, I'll let you guys get started. Hi, everyone. So as Chris has already said, we are Docio, which means I teach in Latin. And Docio is a tutoring site for everyone. Hi, I'm Mark, and I used to work in my family business as a quality manager. 
During this time, I was also involved in systems and website design, which I really enjoyed, but I did feel restricted by the industry I was in. So I wanted to start a new career in tech, and that's when I found the School of Code. Hi, I'm Ravi. I used to work in anti-money laundering, but I wanted to learn how to do a lot of cool things just from my laptop so I can eventually work from anywhere in the world. Hi, I'm Patrick. I was previously working in recruitment. However, I got sick of making sales calls. I wanted to learn how to make innovative and creative apps. And I'm Charlotte. Before School of Code, I used to be a translator. I love communicating ideas and think that in the 21st century, programming languages are the way to do that. So we were tasked with coming up with a building a tuition management app. After doing some research, we discovered that the UK tuition market alone is worth £2 billion, and that's set to grow into 2021. And so what was the problem we were tackling? Well, most tutors will still find their students through word of mouth. And we also found that uh, they were mainly taught in person and not online. And given current circumstances and the general global shift to online services, it's more difficult to do that. So what we thought, we needed students to have a centralised place to find tutors of different prices and different skill levels. So our solution to this was Docio, which allows students of all levels to easily find and compare tutors according to their needs and to their budget. To make the exper experience less daunting for people who are unused to private tuition, tutors can post a video on their profile to introduce themselves, explain what their teaching experience is, and also their teaching style. Tutors don't pay to join the site, instead would take a small percentage of their fee for every lesson. I know you're all excited to see our site, so without further ado, allow us to present it. Guys, take it away. So we're using Netlify to host our site, which allows for a quick setup and supports continuous integration. We built the site itself using Next.js. Upon logging in, you're greeted by the search bar, which is the main focal point of the app. We designed it in this way so that the user can just jump in and start searching for tutors easily and quickly. Below is a mission statement and how it works demos. These are laid out clearly because we wanted functionality and usability to be a priority for the project. What we'll do now is search for a science tutor. And as you can see, the search brings back a full list of tutors that we have in our database. Each tutor has their own profile, displaying summary information about their skills, as well as a little intro video and an image and their price. On the left hand so side, we have our filters, which allows the users to narrow down their search based on their specific requirements. In the future, we'll upgrade this to be query-based search, which will allow for more flexibility and be more cost-effective as our database grows. Now, say we're a tutor who's been totally wowed and we want to create an account. Click on the Create Account button and we're redirected to a sign-up page. Once you fill in your details, your account is unconfirmed until you get to verify it with a code that's sent to your email address. We thought that this was the right level of authentication for the MVP, but in future versions, as we'd be processing payments, we'd want to enable multi-factor authentication using Cognito for added security. Um, now that that's been created, an AWS Lambda function has been triggered, and that has created a user record on our Dynamo database, and that in turn has shared a key with the Cognito user pool. Using the JSON web token provided by Cognito and Amplify, we can verify if the user's logged in and exactly which user it is. So this is always displayed in the top left corner of our page. Now that the user's logged in, we can navigate to the tutor dashboard and edit their profile details. So on this page, these are the details that we thought our tutors would, re would need for the MVP, but in future versions of the site, we'd like to implement the ability for tutors to upload their certification documents, such as maybe their university certificates, just so we can additionally verify they are who they say they are. So this could be achieved through using some secure S3 buckets on AWS. The profile details are then sent off via a patch request to our DynamoDB table, which updates the user record that was created earlier with the triggered Lambda function and Cognito. So let's go ahead and book a, book a lesson with our tutor. So I'm going to log out as if you've just hit the site for the first time. And we're going to find our tutor. So again, we'll search for science. And we can see we've got quite a long list. So let's just narrow that down as we do know roughly what price our new tutor is looking for. There we go. So now we can see our new tutor detail, a quick video intro, testimonials and about me, and then the small details on their reviews. So if we just click now, you can see it brings us to a new window and you can see a calendar where we can pick a new date for the booking. So let's go for a week from now 
and we'll go for some time in the afternoon. That looks perfect. We'll drop in our name and a quick contact email and a note. Oh. And go ahead and confirm that booking. So now that booking's been confirmed, what we can do now is check if that's been received by the tutor. So we're going to log back in. We'll go back to the dashboard and the landing page is the lesson management page. And so you can see here we have the time, date, email, contact and the notes all ready to be confirmed. We can also view this in the calendar and you can see here the 21st, a week from now, a lesson with Patrick ready to go. This is quite empty at the moment because it's his first lesson, but we believe that after a uh, tutor has built up a number of lessons, the calendar is really going to help plan out the, uh, the structure and how he wants to do this. And that concludes the demo. So for the planning phase, we decided early on that our project would need to meet the needs of both the tutor and the student if it was to be a successful product. So from there, we gathered feedback from both groups and made two separate user journeys to build our app upon. Um, to plan our minimal viable product, we used Disney ideation, utilizing the dreamer, realist and critic stage. And we also decided as a group that we'd work within an agile methodology and split, we split the project up into week long sprints. We had three daily standups and a retrospective where we pushed our changes in Git to our development branch and discussed daily progress. We worked in pairs for the majority of the project, but we also mob programmed the trickier parts of the app, which was a great idea as it allowed all four of us to work on the front and back end, giving us a full stack experience. And finally, we decided on a mixture of familiar and new tech and more on that now. So some of that tech is here. We've got the design and planning on the left and the front end tech on the right. Uh, so I'm going to draw your attention particularly to Next.js, which is a JavaScript framework that we used. And what it does, it, it uses server size rendering to create a static web application, which reduces page loading times, which is crucial to search engine optimization. We chose this as most students find their tutors online via a search engine. So we want to be one of those first that come up. I'll also draw your attention to Material UI. Material UI gives us a React component library, which helps us with our design, keeping it consistent. And we're also able still to make small changes to it just to make it our own. Here's just a quick rundown of our design process, starting with a very rough sketch in Photoshop, into Figma just to uh, make it a bit more refined. And then we have some CSS iterations here, and then a slightly different version and how we've used just Figma to create the basic structure and then create the styling on top and then replicating that somewhat inside of CSS. So AWS is currently the dominant player in the cloud infrastructure market, accounting for around 50% of the current market share. We believe that this was a great opportunity for us to expand our existing AWS knowledge and to utilize some of the hottest technology currently around. There are some areas where we believe AWS excels. So we actually experienced firsthand how enhanced their security features can be when we accidentally exposed an AWS access key to GitHub. So within minutes of this happening, we were bombarded with phone calls and emails from AWS support and our IM user linked to this key was automatically restricted in what they could now do. We also liked the cost effectiveness and framework flexibility that AWS provided us. So their free tier and their pay-as-you-go pricing model meant that in total, we only spent 17p for all the services that we list in on this slide. Using the serverless framework combined with, no, combined with Node.js, we were also easily able to code and deploy all of our key Lambda functions for our database. These are the main features that we would like to add into Docio. We want the site to become a platform where tutors and students can do everything they need just with us. For this, we'd like to integrate text editors, code editors, whiteboard, and we'd also like to look at integrating Google Classrooms and Zoom. We also want to integrate a student dashboard, which would be similar to the tutor one that we showed you earlier, so that students can see what lessons they have coming up. We also don't want Docio just to be a place where students find tutors. We would like it to be a tutor hub where there's forums and chat rooms where they can share lesson tips and guidance uh, amongst themselves. So what have we learned? Well, Team Stretch Goals is a pretty ambitious bunch. So we wanted to keep on with the steep learning trajectory that we'd established in the first 12 weeks of the course. So firstly, we've learned to refine our planning. By taking some extra time to break everything into the smallest task possible, we actually found it easier to move forward with the project. We also learned the importance of sprints and retros to keep us along the right path. 
So after our first sprint, we reevaluated what was realistically possible for this MVP as we were just simply trying to achieve too much within the time period that we had. When exploring some of the new tech as well, we sometimes found ourselves stuck down a rabbit hole. Uh, this is where asking the boot campers and the greater tech community for help really helps speed us on our way. So um, yeah, if we get stuck, ask for help sooner. We also learned how to work as a remote team, um, which is a completely new way of working for us. However, by utilizing the technology available and communicating clearly and effectively, we were able to come together and build this app in a real remote dev team setting. So thank you so much for watching our demo. If you're interested in getting in touch with any of us, then our contact details are there. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Great stuff, guys. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, demonstration. Lots of claps going on in the chat. Um, we'll move over to the Q&A. Um, so we've got a question um, about uh, TypeScript. So what was the thought process about TypeScript and how, how did it come into the app? What, what parts were in TypeScript? We used the TypeScript when we were built, we used it building Cognito login. Um, it was mainly, I think it was mainly, we just sort of, we heard about it from Chris. We'd not really used it at all. And we were just interested in seeing, you know, what the differences were between using JavaScript and TypeScript, to be honest. Yeah, it's yeah. quite nice to see the similarities between the two as well, and then adapt that to fit it, the code base. It also made debugging quite a bit easier as well. Yeah. Nice. And uh, what, were your, what were your biggest challenges as a team? I think one of them would just be certain things in AWS that we never experienced before. So setting the right user permissions in um, the IM roles, just linking up the, the the Lambda triggers to Cognito, it was just all these kind of things that were brand new to us. Yeah, yeah. the whole like AWS yeah. structure, yeah. Like learning the intricacies of how they want you to do it and then the things that you can do to make that interact with things that aren't tech, really AWS based yeah. as well. I think the way we overcame that was the mob programming is yeah. we'll, we'll sort of, teamed up on it and eventually we are we cracked the cracked the egg so to speak <laughs> so we had we had a lot of um small wins so when we first um a small wins with aws so when we first had our dynamo our first dynamo db table that was a small win when we first connected cognito up to dynamo db that was another small that win. Was a big win i think <laughs> but yeah that was a big win Developer, yeah a developer's life is a series of small wins <laughs> in between a whole midst of disappointment so, uh, welcome <laughs> welcome to a developer's life uh, okay thanks guys well done thank you um so yeah, we've got the next team uh which uh ben's gonna transition to uh which is team vault um so whilst we welcome those guys in um worth uh worth just going through and uh talking a little bit about who we've uh, helped so far. So 50% of the people that, that have come onto the School of Code um, were unemployed before they came. Um, you've seen the range of backgrounds and heard the range of backgrounds um, people have come from. So I think that just goes to show like it's never too late to start and you can come from any background. If you've got the hunger and desire and, and the pathway, um, actually this social way of learning to code is, is probably the best format we've seen. And you can see that in all the apps and how different they are. You know, they've not learned a cookie cutter approach. Um, everyone's just gone and really um, developed completely different apps with pretty different stacks as well. Um, so without any further delay, Team Vault, welcome. Uh, are you guys ready to go? Yeah. 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 I shall hand over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Hello everyone, uh, welcome and thank you very much for coming on to our demo. We are Team Slackers, um, that's nothing to do with our work ethic. Our initials are S, L and A, which is Sarah, Liz and myself, Alexa. Before School of Code, I was in customer experience, so my role mostly involved getting shouted at by hungry hotel guests. I actually love this job, but there's no meaningful career progression there. So I decided to take a huge leap of faith in, in going to tech. Hi, I'm Sarah. I previously worked as a marketer in higher education. Selling Shakespeare to kids was hard, so I opted to do something more challenging by learning to code. And hi, I'm Liz. I studied history and archaeology, which was about as useful as it sounds in my subsequent office jobs. I left those old jobs behind to follow my dreams because I craved a career full of learning and creating, and because code is the closest thing to magic in real life. 
For our final project, we were tasked with creating a volunteer app. As three individuals, we were delighted with the opportunity to create something unique for a sector we're all interested in. From research and informal discussions with our contacts at Oxfam and Young Minds, we, were discover we discovered that tradition traditionally the third sector found using technology to attract new volunteers to the co their causes challenging. However, the new generation of community-minded young people who want to volunteer are more tech-savvy than those trying to recruit them. With this in mind and an open brief, we decided we wanted to create something that had a fun hook to bring volunteers to the doors of organisations. So how do you meet people in the current day and age? Dating apps, that's how. We wanted to match our volunteers to organisations using gamified functionality with a hint of unpredictability. So let's take a look at what we've created. Welcome to Vault, a volunteering app with dating app functionality that aims to match volunteers with a charity or organization with the hope that they might start a long-term relationship. Vault is a progressive web application. We did consider using React Native, but after our initial user research, we identified two <coughs> organizations and volunteers. Charities and organizations would predominantly use a laptop to access the platform, whilst volunteers are more likely to use their mobiles. Choosing a PWA, we decided we, we would meet the needs of both users. The other advantage of using a PWA is even if the volunteer is offline, they can still run a search on the database for opportunities. Let's explore the volunteer journey. We will now press the button and go to the quiz. At this point, we need to identify the types of charities our prospective volunteers might be interested in. So using the functionality of a personality quiz, we will ask volunteers to answer a series of weighted questions to establish the types of causes they might be interested in, animal, environmental, local groups or events. As we can't ask for a volunteer from the audience today, Chris, will you please do the honours? Of course, why not? Go for it. <laughs> What's your idea of a great way to spend a Saturday? Uh, I'd say spending some quality time with my pet. I don't have one, but I would love one. <laughs> It's film night. What are you watching? Uh, Planet Earth. Let's have a dance. What's the soundtrack? Ooh, uh, let's go Under the Sea. If you could teleport anywhere right now, where would you go? I would say a breathtaking kayak down the Norwegian fjords. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. Let's go. And what annoys you the most? Oh, I'm not even going to read the others. Chewing gum is disgusting. <laughs> and Thank you very much. No problem. It's a match. Our volunteers have found the category of charity they might be interested in. But like real life, this is just a speed dating bit over with. Now we need to shortlist those contenders. Let's press the button and move on to the swipe. To help our user filter their choices, we have implemented probably the most well-known dating app functionality of all. All the charities from the Twist and Charity featured features cards for the user to shortlist. If you're not familiar with the king of dating apps, Tinder, swiping right indicates that you could consider meeting the organization. Swiping left indicates that you wish to delete the option from your shortlist. Chris, will you please do the honors again and tell us who you would like to meet and who you would like to delete? Of course, I've always wanted to try Tinder. Uh, let's do, uh, I hate Love Island, so let's get rid of that. Uh, tree Huggers sounds good. Let's do Tree Huggers. And uh, there is some chewing gum in that picture, but I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt, so I'll, I'll swing right. Thank you very much. Now we've reached our short list of organizations that match the interests of our volunteer. For each charity, a card is displayed with the contact information. So if the user wishes, they can proactively get in touch with the charity or organization to initiate discussion about the opportunities available. Looking at our user personas, we appreciated that the quiz and the swipe parts of the app might appeal to younger volunteers, but that's not for everybody. So we included a directory as well for users to browse. This list is searchable by the organisation name and also keywords, and the search narrows down as you type rather than the user having to press enter or tap or click a search button. 
Once that search is narrowed down, the user can then tap on the card and this expands and it shows all the details that a volunteer might want to see when looking for opportunities. The research that we conducted showed volunteers really appreciate knowing upfront what the organisation requires. So we wanted this to be clearly visible on the app. That's great. So that was the volunteer journey, but let's shift gears to the point of view of an organisation. So if I hop back to our homepage here and hit the I'm an organization button instead, I come to our dashboard. Now I could sign in with Google just out of convenience, but I think I'm going to use my own email and password today. So I'll sign up as a new user with the button below and that takes us to our form. It invites us to put the details in about our organization. So somewhat thematically, I think my organization will be fall in love with tech because let's face it, we want people to fall under the spell of code. So I'll just put my details in there. Yep, a nice website link, a snazzy image to catch people's eyes. Yep, and I think I need somebody to help out with tutoring in JavaScript for two hours a week. What do they need? They need some patience, some know-how, and some public speaking. They have to be confident. So I will be the contact, of course, and I will just get my 100% real email. Here, <laughs> that up, get my little pop-up telling me it's successful, and then I, it goes off to our server. So I'll head over to our list, give it a cheeky refresh, and there we go. Fall in love with tech, ready to enthrall a new crop of volunteers. And if circumstances do change and I need to update the details, I go back into the dashboard, log back in, and they're all pre-populated there to make any changes and resubmit. So thank you very much. That concludes our demo. So how did we create our solution? Throughout the School of Code, we've been using Disney, the Disney Ideation Method to generate and streamline our ideas. As a team, we collectively decided to put our own spin on this concept and change the names of the rooms we would enter. If you're not familiar with the original concept, first of all, you enter the Dreamer Room, or you're, if you're in Team Slackers, the Narwhal Room. In this room, you state all the weird, wonderful, and extraordinary ideas. There's no limits as at the start of the innovation process. As you from the slide, we really did touch on some fantastical ideas like speed dating with charities, moving into fundraising, and verging into becoming the Facebook for volunteers. After the big old ideas comes the room of realism, or in our case, the hedgehog room, because it's time to face the prickly truth. In this room, ideas are shortlisted for future consideration based on their merit and potential to solve the problem. If you take a look at our ideas at this stage, you'll agree they all sound fairly reasonable. However, next we moved into the spoiler room and our goal forced us to make some very hard choices about what was feasible in the next four weeks. As our main focus at this point was considering what constituted as an MVP, we discarded a lot of ideas which you can see on our slide. From the research that we conducted, we created user personas and stories, which we revisited regularly as we developed. We also made a pre-mortem to foresee everything we could possibly imagine could go wrong and how to prevent it. And this paid off really quickly as we were able to spot warning signs in advance and we'd already agreed on how to act on them. And this gave us real trust in each other as a team. Individually, we've learned lots of technical things. There's been plenty of light bulb moments revisiting things we've been taught during the boot camp. However, we agreed the most significant thing we've learned collectively was how to work as an agile tech team. We've been living and breathing agile on the boot camp, often without even realizing it. Uh, but it was very exciting and rewarding to put the methodology into practice on a bigger scale and in a month long project, which was divided into sprints. As part of this, we had a board of our must, should, could have some wish list tasks. And these were story pointed uh, and weighted based on the effort required. Traditionally, this is a sign of Fibonacci number to indicate the difficulty, but in true Slackers fashion, we used animals. It's just what made sense to us. Regular sprints, stand-ups and retros meant that we could react quickly when we saw certain things either might be more difficult than first anticipated, or as things changed, it became apparent that the priority was now different. So when it came time to translate these plans into something actually buildable, it was a bit overwhelming at first. So we started by mapping out each journey, which became the diagram you see here. From there, things started to slot into place. We could then deduce what kind of infrastructure we'd need and what data we'd be dealing with. We mapped where we'd need backend resources and other tools, which brings us on to our stack. 
So we built mainly with React using the skills we developed through the bootcamp for component-based design. We chose to build on this with something new to us, Next.js, mainly for its snappy static loading and server-side rendering. Our user journey is quite fun and zippy as you hopefully saw, so this keeps it that way, as well as the automatic routing between pages that comes built in. And we put in unit tests in place using Jest for the core functions and hooks the app depends on. This made sure that they stayed robust as we developed further and added new features. And we'd use GitHub throughout the course, of course, but this let us really get into the real world Git flow and gave us a sense of security that we could both work synchronously and asynchronously on different parts of the coherent whole. This has been really handy during remote working as well. And moving on from that is Netlify, the seamlessly linked up to that GitHub repo for continuous integration and continuous deployment. Seemed a bit of a no-brainer, really. And as we move into the back end, for authentication, we chose Firebase to manage our login and database of users as it's secure and straightforward. And as our app is a PWA, as we mentioned earlier, we knew we didn't necessarily need an always on back end, unless we go viral. <laughs> we only need it right now to respond when requests come in. A serverless approach fits this best in a scalable, cost efficient way, while any performance penalties wouldn't have a huge impact. Also, serverless smoothly deploys our backend functions straight up into AWS Lambda, so it's convenient to make any changes or tweaks. To be honest, it was a bit of a challenge to get it set up, as it was a departure from the express servers we'd been used to during most of the bootcamp. But once we persevered, asked for guidance from our fellow bootcampers and the amazing wider tech community where we needed it, and put in the elbow grease to get it successfully up and running, it was smooth sailing from there. And this all feeds into AWS DynamoDB. We considered the data we'd be holding, the frequency of requests, and how complicated the queries would be. And this helped us know that key value pairs in NoSQL was the way to go. Also, as we mainly use Postgres SQL during the bootcamp, we wanted to branch out and try something new. So from here, we investigated options and chose AWS DynamoDB because it was well-documented, straightforward, and played nicely with serverless. So now let's take a look into the future. Looking to the future of Vault and in further sprints, in another week, we plan to add a few improvements to our UI. And we also really like the idea of making some quiz questions image-based, so a user could click on a picture that resonates with them, for example. The following sprint would focus on social media shareability, so volunteers could show off their work. And we would also look to add a community notice board to keep users updated with local news and opportunities. Um, the next sprint and beyond, we wanted to look into the process of introducing gamification and a reward system which included badges or a point system to encourage um, further and prolonged engagement with the app. So for example, has been a Vault member for X amount of time or has volunteered for, for X hours. That concludes our presentation of Vault. We really hope you've enjoyed what we've built and we'd like to thank you for coming along again. We are Team Slackers. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks guys, that was really good. Um, so into the Q&A, lots of claps in the chat. Um, can you give an example of uh, the pre-mortem warning signs that you mentioned and um, what did you notice and how did you then deal with that in the pre-mortem? Um, I think the one of the main things that came up, and this was kind of related to remote working and also how coronavirus has affected everything. Because I mean, the, not only transitioning to remote working, but also dealing with something that's actually kind of traumatic for a lot of us. We, we were sort of talking about how we were handling that as people and being really honest with each other and saying, guys, I am not having the best of days. Um, and I think that was, what, what, as I've mentioned before, it, it instilled some real trust in us as a team and that we knew we had each other's backs in that respect. Cool. And um, and you mentioned uh, serverless. So a couple of teams have explored serverless now. What, were the, what was the big driver for you there? Because you said it was a departure from the Express and the, the REST APIs mm -hmm. that you've been setting up uh, from Express. So what, what did you learn from that? Yeah, I think our um, big driver was A, we wanted to try out AWS and learn it um, in practical experience. But also, as it was a PWA, we knew that we wouldn't need something that continuously responded. We didn't need things like web sockets. We didn't need something really active. We could have something that laid dormant until it got pinged that we needed. And that would be the most like cost, cost 
effective way of getting what we needed from the back end. And I think the main thing we learned was to not take for granted expressive middleware. <laughs> um, we came into contact when we were hooking up the front end and the back end, uh, lots of inscrutable cores errors that took some real unpicking to get through it. So we had to really roll up our sleeves and go under the hood in that YAML file and the configuration to sort things out. But we learned a ton about how it worked. Nice. And uh, Sarah, what was your favorite part of the whole experience, the whole project? Um, probably trying to come up with a fun hook um, to get volunteers to interact with the platform. So in, through the quiz, the personality quiz and creating the swipe function as well. Okay, nice. And I, I did say during your presentation, I've always wanted to try Tinder, obviously purely for the, purely for the interaction and the user experience. Uh, as my wife is downstairs, I'm just clarifying <laughs> that. Thank you. Okay. Well done, team. Let's get the next team in. So, uh, one last team. Last but not least, uh, we have um, the meal planner team. So, we're going to explore uh, some meal planning um, in an app. Um, we have Murray, we have Hannah, we have Josh, and we have Sam Weber. So, how are you guys doing? You okay? Yeah, good, thanks. Can Ready you hear us? Go? Yeah, I can hear you. We've got Murray and Sam, and then we're just waiting on Hannah and Josh. Yeah. Um, so, after this, we will uh, tile this up, and uh, yeah, you, you'll have all designed a well-earned break. So, you can just chill, relax, last one of the day. So, uh, when you guys are ready, take it away. Awesome. I think the audience probably deserves a break by now as well. Uh, so, we are Team Meal Things, uh, and thanks for coming to our demo day here. Uh, I'm Dr. Murray Hoggett, and for the last 10 years, I've been a research scientist working on volcanoes, and I liked the tech side of my old job, so I wanted to transition to that as a full-time career. Hi, I'm Hannah. I've just come back from Guatemala, where I was running social impact businesses, and I'm really inspired to work in tech because of its potential to create positive change at scale. Hi there, my name's Josh. I used to work for the NHS as an HR officer. Uh, I really wanted to be a part of an innovative culture and I really feel like tech's the place for that. And hi, my name's Sam. I used to be a barber before. I really enjoyed the creative side of cutting hair, but I want to positively impact more people. And I believe working in tech is the best way to do this. So the importance of health is universal. But healthy eating in modern society can be challenging and expensive as well. In the you UK, guys just want to share your slides as well, sorry. Oh. Just share your screen. Very good idea. Doesn't matter, <laughs> you're going well, but I thought might as well tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that'd be good. I always ruin every presentation I'm in. So this is why I'm not included in group presentations. There it is. Cool. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, in the UK alone, um, the cost of the NHS due to poor diet is projected to be £9.7 billion by 2050. That's a huge number. And not only is this a huge financial strain on the nation, um, it's also a strain on the health of those people. And we really wanted to make an app that was massive, that would massively improve this on a national scale and potentially international scale too. So in order to really get to the root of that problem, we wanted to find out from our potential users how we could solve that for them. And the way we did that was we combined a questionnaire, sent it out on multiple platforms and did some competitive benchmarking. The users came back and they told us that they wanted it to be easy. So no more counting calories or looking at labels. They wanted it to be really fast. So for us to automate all of the tricky bits and the dull bits. And they also wanted it to be really tailored to them. So really specific to their needs and their diet. We used that research and we con conducted a further survey to look at the minimum viable product that we wanted to achieve. 
They told us that they wanted allergies and preferences and dietary goals to be defined, and that to serve up daily and weekly recipes and a shopping list. So without further ado, now we've got all our tech going, let's go on to our live demo. So now we're gonna show you our Meal Things app. So yeah, so this is our home screen for the app. It's got our custom made logo in the middle there. Throughout the whole app, we wanted a really simplistic design uh, and that goes for this page as well. So you've just got the login and the get started to register. So as soon as you're a new user, we'll click get started. Uh, we created our own custom authentication system here because um, we really wanted to implement what we'd learned at the School of Code from scratch as well. Uh, we used JSON web tokens for the authentication, storing them client side. And then with each server request, they'd get validated. So, and we also validate the whole form on the front and back end. Sign up page. So this is where you create your sign, uh, your sign in uh, details for when you log in got to use an email that's not already stored in the user database. Uh, and all the passwords are hashed using bcrypt. And this is for maximum security. So if you click next, Josh, we'll go to the landing page. We invested a good amount of time planning the look and feel of the landing page as it's the first thing the user sees upon signing in. We're in for a modern slick and clean design that just invites the user to take a deeper look into our app. In terms of simplicity, we took an agile approach to the feedback we received during our test runs. We have now trimmed the landing page to just six options. Um, so under the hood, we have Amazon Web Service, which is a relational database service supplying our app with a rich list of tailored meal options. This has been set up so that as soon as the user logs in, meal options are already readily available and usable, allowing for a snappier user experience. So I'm just gonna move over to the goals and diets page. Uh, we wanted to make this app personal as if it was your friend in your pocket. You're immediately greeted by a page asking about yourself and what you're trying to achieve for our app. I'm just going to put into my information here. Sweet. And I'm particularly interested in fat loss and saving time whilst I cook. I'm pressing next. I'm directed to the allergies page where I can identify any allergens that I may have. So for demonstration, I'm just going to put dark side and soya beans in. Uh, so what's that doing under the hood? It's feeding our database with your preferences and your dietary needs. And although not all filter fields are fully operational as of now, Meal Things aims to bring you meals that you'll really love. So now you've registered and you specified your diet and your preferences. I don't know about you, but I'm getting hungry. So let's go on to today's recipe where we can see what we've got to cook up. So on the recipe page, week to week, our recipes are actually changing by default. So that gives you the variety that you need without having to think about it. In addition to that, the recipes are stored in local storage. So if you're at a friend's house and cooking there, or you don't have access to the internet, you can do that conveniently and easily. In addition to that, we have the methods and ingredients buttons, which you can toggle between while you're cooking. And then if you want to change your mind, so say today I've got sizzling sirloin set up, but on the fly, I've you know, I fancy something different, we can go to a random recipe generator, which will allow me to do that. So I prefer peachy pork chops today. I can set that to my menu. Excellent. And you can see here that we have our rep menu cards, which wrap to the space on the device, which is actually stable on all devices and all screen sizes. And in addition to that, we have these visual images, which really pop, stand out of the screen and allow you to choose quickly and easily what you'd like to eat to your schedule. So now let's take a look at our recipes for the week and see we've, what we've got on the menu. So on our weekly meal planner here, we have a draggable list so the user can order and reorder their menu choices for the week. So if they want, for example, fish on a Friday, they can have that. Uh, so dragging uh, around the meals will duplicate them both on the database and in local storage. So duplicating on the database means that the app is synced by default across different devices if it's installed on multiple platforms and also having it in local storage makes it fast for a quick user experience. There's also a quick slick pop-up feature for each individual item, meaning that users can take a quick glance at ingredients and their nutritional breakdown. Now let's go to our final feature of the app, which is our shopping list. So the shopping list is a cool little feature which is aggregating together all of the ingredients for the week's worth of recipe 
This is really handy so they can walk around the supermarket and check things off in real time. Under the hood, we're using natural language processing, which is combining together all the ingredients. And any duplicates, for example, milk appearing in two different recipes, it removes one of them and then uses natural language processing to combine the quantities. So if one is in pints and another in liters, for example, that is automatically handled by the user, for the user. And that concludes the demo for our app. Uh, we have more. We also have a static web page. So a static web page is made using Gatsby, uh, which the team will just bring up for us now. So the purpose of it is to give us a platform on the web for users to discover our app through and in, to hopefully entice them into downloading our app. So you can see there's a common design between our mobile app and our website, sharing colors, fonts, and visual themes. Uh, we built it with Gatsby and React to give a fast SEO-friendly website. That concludes our live demo. Which brings us to the user personas. Here, we really try to dive into the mindset of our user and really understand who would benefit most from using our app. We looked into users who may be keen to shed some weight and make drastic life changes, perhaps those who are keen to gain muscle mass but are struggling to find that balance between making a healthy meal and gaining size. The challenge a new mother may face trying to ensure that she gets all of her nutrients whilst looking after her newborn. Uh, we have attempted to address this with this saving time goal, which aims to shave time off meal preparations for herself so that she can get back to what really matters. We really try to create a product that could be used by just anybody. So we use the Kanban style of the Agile methodology. We worked in week-long sprints. We had three daily stand-ups. And we use these Kanban boards on GitHub so we could easily track our backlog and also different things that needed testing. Um, we quantified the relative difficulty of each task using the Fibonacci sequence. And we did this because it, it made it easier for us to prioritize what needed doing when. We followed a specific Git workflow as well. We branched off from a development branch for each new feature of our app. And then we only pushed major changes to the main master branch. And this Git strategy was really important in helping us maximize our team progress, but minimizing our code base conflicts. Here you can see the wireframes. So we use Figma to design these. Uh, we like the way with Figma, you can make alterations to the pages simultaneously. So as a team, we could all change different pages at the same time. And this improved our efficiency at the design phase, phase of our app. We used a large tech stack and really wanted to challenge ourselves as a team to learn. Um, some of the highlights really included on the back end, getting more familiar with AWS services, which we chose as a scalable secure backend solution and deploying via Docker. Uh, both of these use microservices, which automate a lot of the process um, and ensure that resources and costs are kept as low as possible. That then allowed us to focus a lot more on the front end, where we also used React Native and Expo, both of which were new technologies for all four team members. Uh, so we really enjoyed getting to grips with all of them. We chose React Native specifically because um, we wanted a native app that was platform independent um, and that would have uh, a common interactive user for interface. Um, we found it was really, really inspiring and you could do a lot with it. Some of the specific things that we really enjoyed um, were like the fact that you could have code reusability, modular architecture, um, and it had a load of handy solutions and libraries. We've really enjoyed all 16 weeks of School of Code. It's been an incredible experience and we've learned a huge amount. On this particular project, on our post-mortem, we decided that the key learnings were new technologies um, because of all of the new technologies that we brought into the process, not only learned, but also were able to apply in, in something productive, um, and then also the teamwork side of things. So we really loved working together as a team. We had a really positive environment, um, and we really learned a lot with Git and, and kind of managing that team environment, not only within our own team, but also collaboratively within all the other schemes of School of Code. Um, the lessons we learned, we also felt were, were really useful going forward. So we, we realized that AWS technologies are incredibly effective. There's over 180 services and we only really scratched the surface. Um, so we're looking forward to learning more. 
In addition to that, the careful architecture really saved time. So planning up front, um, all of the databases, how they would interact, and then how information would be passed between front end and back end effectively, that helped us move forward quite fast later down the line. So I think we're all pretty happy as a team with what we've delivered as an MVP, but there is a whole bunch of extra features that we would like to add moving forward. So with a few days more, we would like to add in filling in an, uh, a supermarket shopping cart automatically. So this would actually also give us the opportunity to monetize our app through affiliate schemes or commission, should we want to go down that route. With a few days more than that, we would add accessibility features such as colorblind friendly color palettes. With a few days beyond that, we could add in push notifications for taking exercise, uh, drinking water and things like this. And the last few features that we would like to add in, we've actually already done some work on. So we already have bits towards a working pedometer and maps integration. And there's other features that we would add in with time. So at every stage of this project, we really tried to think about scalability in the future. So we built the back end specifically with flexibility to scale rapidly should it need to be. We built around an AWS back end stack. Uh, with EC2 instances and so on, which could very quickly be scaled up if needed. And on the front end, we wrote a highly maintainable React code base, which if the tech team were to grow rapidly, that would be easy to scale as well. And finally, we really think that uh, our app has huge potential for impact here. The overall problem here is that there's around 40 million overweight or obese people in the UK, according to the government's own statistics. And that comes with huge potential health problems for those individuals. With just a 1% market penetration, this could literally change the lives of hundreds of thousands of people in the UK alone, not even including the international market. And that is the end of our presentation. Thanks loads for taking the time to listen to us. We have been Murray, myself, Josh, Hannah, and Sam. If you've got any questions, please do reach out to us. Thanks again for listening. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, thanks, guys. So we'll, we'll swing quickly to the Q&A. Um, so you mentioned React Native. Um, so a couple of teams explored it. Uh, you guys went for, for building with it. Um, what were the big learning points there and what did you, what did you take from that experience? Uh, I guess quite a lot. Uh, so we'd, we'd used React uh, and websites and PWAs and things uh, on the boot camp. So we could do some of these already, but we really wanted to explore something totally new. Uh, and both React Native and mobile development was entirely new to us. Uh, I think there's a whole bunch of features that were awesome, actually. Uh, Expo, the development environment, uh, is really cool, has loads of cool features and functionality built in. It's got things like built-in uh, push notifications, built-in pedometers, lots of sensors. Uh, that flexibility was awesome. Uh, so, on the, on the other hand, uh, there's, there are some challenges with it. Uh, before we started working on it, we hadn't realized that, for example, routing is totally different so the, compared to normal React. So the concept of screens and stack and tab navigators and switch navigators, all of that's entirely new. Uh, but overall, it's awesome. Really cool tech. Mm. Nice. Very different syntax as well. Um, we had to learn, uh, for example, like a div tag that you might use in normal React. That's a view tag. Uh, we had to learn all the new tags and you have to create separate style sheets for each screen. Um, so yeah, that took a bit of getting used to as well. No, but you coped really well with it. And uh, really impressive that you've uh, gone into Docker there. Um, Hannah, was that challenging or easy? I, I think it was, yeah, it was a huge learning curve throughout the pro project. Um, I think everything we took on as a challenge um, and really kind of pair programmed, mob programmed throughout the process, um, all of us really chipping in and, and moving each other forward. Uh, Docker was great. It was really exciting to use as we saw the huge potential for, for implementation um, and specifically, you know, working a lot more in the terminal from the command line was great to get to grips with in addition to then kind of doing all these random things um when you were bug hunting like activating demons not uh, a google search that i'd anticipated myself making 16 weeks ago um but yeah it all it all kind of 
really was satisfying when we dropped our own local server and it worked on the AWS platform. Great. And uh, Josh, what was what was your favorite part of the whole experience? Ooh, um, it's hard just to say one, but I think the way that Chris and Ben have set us up with, you know, the, the type of learning that just enables us to just go off and learn new things was quite, it's, it's quite a thrilling exper experience. Like as Murray was saying, we, none of us have experience using React Native, but because of uh, the learning that we've had, it, it wasn't that hard of a transition to jump to a new uh, development uh, environment and actually flourish and be able to create something. So I think that itself was quite enjoyable. Not to mention the remote, um, the remote setup uh, that we had going on. So I think all around, it's been quite, it's been quite the experience. Okay, great. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, round of applause. Thank you. Cheers. And you. Uh, yeah, you can go and have a well-deserved break now. So <laughs> Ben will Ben will sort that out. Uh, okay, so um, I'll just quickly wrap up. Really, um, let's just share a screen again. Try and do it properly this time. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so um, the, the hero's journey is how every story in the history of man has 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 gone. Um, so you start in normality, and you you sort of have a a call to action, a call to adventure, to to journey into the unknown. And it's your choice to either, you know, take that step or just return to, you know, status quo. Um, and really what we've seen here is uh, everyone has taken that call to adventure, which was, uh, you know, applying for the School of Code, jumping in. Um, if you make that jump, you will always find supporters. And that's what they found in, in the group and the tech community, supporters to help them along that journey. There's sure to be some trials and failures and some experiments and some learning, but in the end, you're going to get some growth and you're going to find some new skills and, uh, you know, you're going to complete some challenges. And we've seen that culminate today, like all of these, uh, that, like those live demos, really, without a hitch. Um, when you're all presenting remotely, we've had to navigate like 30 different Internet connections there and, uh, you know, loads of different screen shares and stuff like that. So for that to go smoothly, just um, you know, can't praise you guys enough for how that's um, flown by. Um, and in the end, when you complete those sort of challenges, you return as a changed person. And, uh, you know, your status quo now is very different. So what's happened is we've taken a, a bunch of random people and now they are tech people. You know, that's their new status quo. And they're, they're going to get another call to adventure and they're going to keep meeting supporters and keep improving because that's the journey they're on. And, uh, you know, hopefully... You know, some of some of uh, you out there have got some hiring opportunities, some job opportunities, and and that will be the next call to adventure. And just imagine how much progress they can make, uh, you know, within um, that supportive environment. Um, so it's sort of like um, if anyone's watched SAS Who Dares Wins, which I'm pretty fixed on at the moment. Uh, they take a bunch of celebrities and they stick them through the SAS selection process. Um, it's basically that, but for tech. Um, if anyone's watched that, there's probably less swearing and weedier instructors in the School of Code, but it really is that sort of like intense, um, you know, challenge that people really rise to and uh, hopefully you can see the results. So uh, just once again, like, what are we doing here? Um, we, we are now looking to, you know, help these people get into the jobs they deserve, start their tech careers. Um, it's obviously a mad time at the moment with coronavirus, but there are opportunities and, um, you know, the, the journey that these have been on, you'd be mad to miss out on that sort of talent and uh, the diversity of backgrounds and just the, the value they bring to companies is, is tremendous, really. So um, we're always looking for supporters and sponsors that help feed the boot camp and, and help us get started. Um, but in the end, this is all about matching demand for, uh, for the industry. And if we're doing our job right, then there should be talent there that's ready to go and work. There's going to be holes that, you know, the 16 weeks is a, is a massive uh, amount of time in some ways, but it's, it's insignificant. It's like first semester of university. And we already get people to a much higher level than university grads. Um, so, you know, it's, it's talent that's ready to work, hungry to learn. And uh, we need your support to, to help do that. So um, we've got that Meerkat family again. 
uh, the boot campers that we've got at the moment. And our ambition is to keep growing that family, get these popping up everywhere and help everyone transition into uh, this new uh, tech economy. Um, there's loads of stuff that we, uh, we run through. Uh, we get teaching support, curriculum shaping, mentoring, workshops. All of these things are facilitated by supporters. So I'd just like to thank everyone that has um, you know, offered projects, um, visits and in the end those of you that are going to you know try and um, help give people the first steps into their careers um, I'd love to thank the team so we've got Bamwo, uh, Ben and Liz who have uh, carried me through this process um, so you've met Bamwo if you are engaging with us on a, on a company side um, Liz is responsible for all of the social media stuff because I uh, detest social media I only use it to voice complaints at footballers when I used to watch them perform, haven't done that in a while. So uh, Liz has been taking care of all of that. And Ben's really come into his own with the, the teaching and he, he's going to grow boot camp on boot camp, really. So just to leave you there, thanks very much for the West Midlands Combined Authority for, for supporting us this time. And, uh, you know, we've really got an ambition to, to make a massive change in the region. Um, you know, uh, the, the regional skills problem is going to grow, um, especially at the moment with uh, more people getting furloughed and becoming unemployed. There's a, there's a real need when people are down to help them and transition them into the economy because tech is going to be the driving force. It's going to be the engine of change in the economy going forward. And, uh, you know, I think we're all in agreement of that. Um, so it's going to be really important to, uh, to try and scale up um, how many people we can help. Um, I'd like to thank Spinks, who are our recruitment partner, and Jack um, is going to be uh, hopefully speaking to you guys soon and reaching out and helping align people with the right candidates and making sure there's a good fit there. Um, and I'd like to just thank uh, everybody involved, really, mentors, guest speakers, companies who visited, um, Google, who were supposed to visit, and, uh, you know, coronavirus called that off, but sent through a load of swag, a load of goodies for everyone. Um, I'd like to thank uh, you guys, and also just remind you, you know, the only way this works is for, you know, us to make uh, the talent and bring it in from everywhere that companies need and for companies to come and support. You know, we want to help more people. We want to keep producing top tech talent and proving it can come from anywhere. And we want to make it stupid for people to, to have to spend £10,000 on a boot camp, which doesn't care whether they get a job or not. Um, you know, we want to be that diverse pool of ready to work talent that helps solve your hiring problems and helps drive your company forward. But to do that, we need your support. So we need you to hire. We need you to partner with us on this journey to change education, uh, change recruitment and, uh, and change the world, uh, really. So what we want to do is change that lens that you look at talent through. Um, you know, this is really a community that we're trying to um, support and grow. So get in touch if you want to speak to any boot campers about the hiring or employment. Get in touch with myself, Bamwo or Jack from Sphinx. And we'll look to make that as quick, as easy and as possible for you. Um, and that is it. So thanks, guys. Email us, tweet us, visit the website. Um, I'd like to thank uh, everybody that's had anything to do with this, um, all the team, all the boot campers that have put their trust in me and, and Ben and, and the whole team to, uh, you know, make that leap of faith into tech. And uh, yeah, most of all to you, the audience, the supporters. Thanks for coming, taking time out of your day and uh, getting involved. So from there, get in touch with us if you want to speak to any um, boot campers. We're going to let them go off and blow off some steam. We'll have a pub quiz later, which we'll get the, um, we'll get the link sent out to everyone for. But uh, hopefully, just keep supporting and uh, keep, showing, keep showing up to these sorts of things and helping us you know, change what is the regional talent pool. So that's it, really. Thanks very much for your time. Hope you've enjoyed yourselves. Just give a massive round of applause to uh, all of the boot campers again. That was incredible. And then we will see you all soon, hopefully. Bye bye. Where did those clones go?